A quorum being present, this meeting of the board's curriculum committee will come to order. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad everybody could make it. The informational summary which describes the committee's last meeting has been provided and it does not require committee approval. And as by special announcement, the school system will be closed on Friday, April 19th and Monday, April 22nd. The Education Transparency Act description will be posted on the board's website on Tuesday, April 23rd. Additionally, we are having um, tech technology issues and any of the PowerPoints that will be covered tonight will at some point be uploaded to bcps.org. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. McComas. Okay, so welcome and thank you everyone. Um, if I could ask Dr. Koth, Dr. Roth, and Dr. Morrison to come forward and Dr. Brown, I know. Um, our first order of business is our uh, STAT mid-year report. So this is an informational update um, on our STAT evaluation process. So I will be brief and, and then get out of the way. Uh, this is the fifth year that uh, Johns Hopkins University has come here to give us a mid-year evaluation on uh, our progress with the, the STAT initiative. Uh, tonight we're uh, joined by Dr. Morrison and Dr. Riley. Dr. Morrison's been coming here for, for quite a bit, but for those of you that uh, are not familiar. Um, they have, um, again, pr been providing consistent evaluation of, of this program over time, and we have certainly been looking forward to hearing uh, their mid-year evaluation from this year. And with that, I will be pleased to get out of the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, and good afternoon. I guess it's still afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so we'll do a little bit more contextual information just to get everyone up to speed, since I know we've presented or I've presented, this might be like my ninth or 10th time, yeah. but this is your first time to hear it. So try to make it uh, thrilling and exciting for you. <laughs> All right, so um, I guess I'll just tell you, so we'll start with what you have a slide two, um, which shows the STAT evaluation model. And this is a temporal model. So it shows that the professional development, including those offered and provided by administrators, STAT teachers, and then all affecting classroom teachers, would then lead into measurable outcomes that we would expect to see an impact on in year one. And those would be the classroom environment, teacher practice, digital content, which then affects student engagement. And then in year two and beyond, we'd expect to see an impact on 21st century skills. Then in years three and four, we would expect to see an impact on the ultimate goals of improving student achievement and graduating globally competitive students. And then on slide three, you should see kind of the stat experience so that you know um, that different schools and different grades within those schools begin stat at different time points. So it's kind of a cohort-based approach. So the first implementers were the 10 Lighthouse schools, grades one and three in 2014-15. Then in 2015-16, we had the second cohort, which is Lighthouse grades K-4-5 and Lighthouse grade six. In 2016-17, we had Lighthouse grades seven and Lighthouse grades nine through 12. And then in 2017-18, Lighthouse grade eight started. So at this point, we've got all Lighthouse school grades implementing, but they're at different experience. So some are just in year two of implementing, whereas grades one through three are in year five. And then on the next slide, we talk about our data sources. So these are the different pieces that went into the mid-year evaluation report. And the data sources are different for the mid-year report as compared with the summative report that will deliver end of June. So for this mid-year evaluation report, we have a mixed methods evaluation design that does include both quantitative and qualitative data sources. For the current year, our participant group was restricted to Lighthouse Elementary, Lighthouse Middle, and Lighthouse High School only at the district's request. The sampling approach was done to better investigate the initiative's long-range impact in the schools with the most extensive integration of the STAT program. So given that previous years of the evaluation explored impacts across the entirety of the BCPS district, the narrower focus is intended to complement the comprehensive results discussed in earlier reports and facilitate capturing more nuanced insights into the evaluation's final year. So first we had the STAT teacher program survey. This is developed and administered by the district. It includes both closed-ended and open-ended questions. 
second are our classroom observations in the Lighthouse schools. So we conduct four classroom observations, or at least four, in all elementary, middle, and high schools. This fall, we conducted 80 classroom observations, resulting in 1,600 minutes of direct classroom observations. And we compared the fall 2018 observations to the baseline observations, which differed based on the group. So like Lighthouse grades one through three baseline happened in year one, whereas Lighthouse grade eight might have happened two years ago. So there is that difference in the cohort. We use the OASIS 21 instrument, which is an instrument that was co-constructed between the district and us. In the spring of 2015, we conducted a reliability study. So we looked to see to what extent do different observers, after they go through training and calibration, to what extent are they um, likely to record the same or very similar rating items. And what we found was that the inter-rater inter reliability Pleasure. of the instrument was uh, 0.972. So just for context, Reliability could range from 0 to 1.0, so having a 0.972 gives you a lot of trust in what we're doing with observations. And then a randomly selected subsample of Lighthouse Elementary Schools and Lighthouse Middle Schools and Lighthouse High Schools participated in student focus groups. So here we um, randomly selected students that returned parental consent forms um, and had the, the students participate in focus groups. Right, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Riley for results. Great. Excuse me, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us which slide are you on this one? Slide yep. five at this point? Yep. Okay, That's I just it. want to make sure because I know in listening. <laughs> Normally I, we have a clicker, so we'll, we'll, yeah, I know. we'll try I, to I flag appreciate that. the. <laughs> The queuing as we go. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. So slide five. Um, so talking a little bit more about the stat evaluation model. Uh, so based on the stat logic model, um, professional development should lead to measurable outcomes and the achievement of BCPS goals. Uh, so a survey was administered to all classroom teachers within the district to um, obtain their perspectives on the stat teacher program, uh, which is a very important part of the stat initiative. So we're talking about their stat teachers here. Um, during the evaluation's current year, we focused specifically on the survey results uh, of Lighthouse Elementary, Middle, and High School teachers. So moving on to slide six. Thank you. Um, so uh, to start, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, again, the, the results of the survey. Um, so one of the items on the survey asked classroom teachers uh, implementing STAT to indicate how helpful they felt the different modes of professional development offered by their STAT teacher uh, were. And it's probably worth emphasizing here that the professional development offered by the STAT teachers is pedagogy focused. Um, it's not just concerning kind of interacting with the, the tech issues with the device and things like that. It's very much instructionally focused. Um, so as you can see on the slide, overall the vast majority of teachers reported that they found all four of the professional development modes to be helpful. So large group, small group, one-to-one -one support, and independent learning. Um, one-to-one -one support from the STAT teacher was generally viewed as the most useful mode followed by use of small group professional development. Uh, trends were generally consistent across the elementary, middle, and high school uh, teachers with regard to these perceptions. Um, a couple of things did stick out, though, with regard to differences. Uh, first, White House elementary teachers um, were most likely to report that they found the professional development useful overall, so they typically had the highest ratings. Um, for example, uh, roughly 70% of White House elementary teachers reported that large group professional development was very helpful to them while over 85% reported that small group professional development was very helpful. Um, and if you contrast this with what we found from Lighthouse Middle and High School teachers, uh, they were less than half of these groups, um, I guess, reported that, that professional development was very helpful. So if you want to move forward to uh, slide seven. Thank so you. Next, during the, uh, the teacher survey, uh, teachers were asked about the specific types of PD that they've uh, participated in this year. So here, classroom teachers uh, reported participating in a variety of different professional development uh, learning opportunities offered by their STAT teachers. Um, and as highlighted on the slide by a wide margin, teachers participated in training workshops more so than any other form of professional development. Uh, professional development that teachers participated in, again, was similar for elementary, middle, and high school teachers, with just a few exceptions. Uh, first, a visibly larger proportion of Lighthouse elementary teachers participated in analysis of data with their STAT teacher. And also a higher proportion of high school teachers participated in learning walks or observed another teacher's classroom this year. So slide eight. So next on the survey, uh, classroom teachers were asked to indicate which learning opportunities they would like to participate in during the remainder of the 18-19 school year. Um, 
The professional development opportunities that teachers most expressed an interest in participating in, again, was similar for Lighthouse uh, Elementary, Middle and High School teachers, just a few exceptions. Lighthouse Elementary and High School teachers most fre frequently indicated a desire to observe the STAT teacher model instruction or observe another teacher's classroom. Um, middle school teachers expressed a preference for just more training workshops. Then in addition to the closed-ended items that are displayed on your slide, uh, classroom teachers were also asked to provide some narrative comments with regard to the specific topics they'd like to learn about in PD moving forward. And a couple of things came up here repeatedly. Um, first, both elementary and middle school teachers uh, reported an interest in learning more about Schoology, the new um, LMS program used mm -hmm. in Baltimore County. Uh, elementary teachers in particular very much just wanted more professional development in general. Um, middle school teachers, in addition to wanting to learn more about Schoology, also uh, frequently expressed an interest in working with a stat teacher to, be to develop blended learning lesson plans and designing more engaging content for students. And then high school teachers were most interested in generally improving their skills related to designing blended learning opportunities. Uh, and high school teachers also mentioned their interest in professional development on enhancing their ability to use targeted small group instruction. Mm -hmm. So next slide, slide nine. So uh, lastly, on the teacher survey, uh, teachers were asked um, to provide some feedback concerning their perceptions of their stat teacher in their school. And uh, findings from the survey uh, this year are consistent with what we've seen in previous years in that classroom teachers' uh, perceptions of their stat teachers continue to be highly positive. Um, so uh, again, teachers continue to find the professional development offered by their stat teachers to be very helpful, um, particularly that is which is developed in one-to-one -one sessions or small groups. Perceptions of the stat teacher's professionalism, accessibility, coaching abilities, and role in helping teachers move instruction in a more learner-centered direction consistently remain very positive. Uh, and then respondents from across all grade spans uh, were particularly fervent in expressing the belief that their stat teacher is highly approachable and flexible as an instructional resource, and many teachers feel that they're very much invaluable to them and their school. Um, for these reasons, uh, teachers continue to express a sentiment that many have shared in previous years that they believe the stat teacher's time should be protected in order to maximize this kind of role as an instructional coach. And in order to do that, it's important that, um, or they feel that it's important their stat teacher's role in administrative activities be minimized. So uh, moving to slide 10 and, and revisiting the stat evaluation model. Um, so moving on from the survey results, uh, in order to assess the early impact on the classroom environment and teacher practice, classroom observations were conducted in Lighthouse Elementary, Middle, and High Schools. Um, you want to move to slide 11? Uh, so here we're talking about the observation rating scale a little bit. Um, for the observations, uh, as uh, Dr. Morrison indicated, we visited a sample of classrooms in each of the schools um, and used the OASIS 21 instrument to record what was happening in each of the classrooms during the visits. Uh, and using this observation instrument, we looked at components specific to the classroom environment, teacher practice, student engagement, and uh, also activities related to P21 skills. And each item was rated to the extent it was observed during a 20-minute observation session. So the observation rating scale ranges from not observed at all to extensively observed. And uh, the overall goal with the observations is to just basically take a bunch of snapshots as to what's happening in classrooms across the Lighthouse group and see if, on average, instruction is kind of shifting in any way since the baseline, based on what we see. So talking about the observation results a little bit on uh, slide 11, excuse me, slide 12. So the, uh, to begin, the, as part of what we looked at during the observations was the classroom environment. So this kind of deals with um, uh, what we see posted on the walls in the classroom, how students are seated, how students may move purposefully around the classroom. And observation ratings this fall uh, from the observations we conducted were similar with those that were gathered at baseline and previous years um, that we've done the observations. So none of the subgroups that made up uh, the four Lighthouse cohorts demonstrated significant differences on any classroom observation items this fall. And um, classroom observation ratings, uh, excuse me, classroom environment ratings were also similar across the four cohorts as well. So as we've seen in previous years, materials re that reflected the content being taught and materials that promote independent thinking were consistently observed and consistently visible in classrooms. Um, also with previous years, however, students were seldom observed moving around the classrooms independently to gather learning materials, and they were also seldom observed using different workspaces for different tasks. I'm going to move to slide 13. So 
Next, during the observations, we also took a look at teacher practices. And uh, as with the teacher environment, um, observation ratings for the most part continue to be pretty similar in these areas with those gathered at baseline. Um, so across all cohorts, teachers made more frequent use of coaching and facilitating than they did of didactic presentations. Uh, students were observed with moderate frequency initiating academically meaningful communication with the teacher or other students. Um, and then the use of higher level questioning and higher, higher order instructional feedback varied a little bit by cohort. So cohort one and two classrooms, which represent those who are most experienced in STAT, and also those that are generally at the primary level, uh, exhibited more visibly more frequent instances of higher level questioning and higher order instructional feedback than cohort three or four classrooms. Um, Overall, though few classrooms across any of the cohorts made especially frequent use of flexible grouping arrangements, instances of this strategy were also observed a bit more in cohort one or two. So on slide, four, slide 14. So uh, during the observations, we also examined the impact of professional development on the second category of measurable outcomes, so student engagement 21 skills. Uh, we expected that since uh, stat was still in its early stages of implementation within the schools, that we might see a small amount of evidence relating to effects in these areas. So slide 15. In terms of observation items uh, for things that are designed to enhance student engagement, so uh, use of the um, digital tools for learning, one-to-one -one devices, collaborative learning activities, um, and uh, use of multiple modes of student responses, uh, observation ratings from this fall were again mostly similar with what was recorded at the baseline time points. Um, overall, students were observed using digital tools for learning in a little, a little bit less than half of the observed classrooms, so one-to-one -one devices were seen in, in a little less than half of classrooms. Um, student independent work was observed with a higher frequency than collaborative learning activities or student discussion. Multiple modes of student responses were observed in under half of classrooms. And cohort one and two classrooms, so those most experienced in the stat, were observed incorporating collaborative learning activities at a higher frequency than cohort three or four classrooms. So in slide 16, Lastly, talking about the uh, instructional approaches emphasizing P21 skills. Um, so as with previous years, these uh, types of activities were generally seldomly observed in uh, cohorts during the most recent observations. Um, and this is consistent with what we've seen before. Um, problem solving activities, project basis based approaches to instruction, and uh, inquiry based approach approaches to instruction were seldom observed in classrooms regardless of cohort. Um, but then also, as with previous years, instruction that explicitly emphasized the incorporation of authentic or real-world context it was seen more often than other P21 types of instruction, but was also observed relatively infrequently overall. The slide 17. So we'll finish up talking about, uh, I guess, the results of the student focus groups that we conducted, um, as, as Dr. Morrison mentioned earlier. Um, for uh, each of these, we, uh, I, I guess for each of the schools, we um, spoke with a sample of about five to six students from each school this fall to, uh, uh, to kind of see what their perceptions of the STAT initiative were. Um, and the results from these are, are pretty uh, congruent with what we found in the past. Uh, student focus group results suggested that overall, students continue to have positive opinions concerning the STAT initiative. And they also feel that it continues to impact their learning experiences in school for the better. Uh, so elementary, middle, and high school students all consistently expressed that they believe the devices make learning easier and also more fun. Uh, also across all grade levels, students highlighted the value of the devices as tools for learning. So examples shared by students here include uh, the ease with which they can now organize their coursework, uh, the ability to access a variety of instructional programs, the ability to type instead of handwrite assignments, and the ability to do research on the internet. In terms of students' favorite activities, uh, elementary and middle school students most often highlighted instructional uh, resources and programs, Kahoot, Discovery Education, Quizlet, Weebly, um, flip charts, things of that nature all come up here quite a bit. High school students uh, frequently shared examples of using computer programs, things like Board Builder and Microsoft PowerPoint to actually create projects. That's something they've really enjoyed. Um, in terms of uh, students' least favorite aspects of the program, uh, as with previous years, technical issues with the devices, including issues with internet con connectivity, slow processing speeds, um, and things of that nature, these were consistently listed by students as the elements of the initiative they liked the least. 
And um, I think it's probably important to note this year, students across all grade spans indicated they perceive there's been an increase in these issues this year. Uh, middle and high school students were particularly um, fervent in believing that. Um, in terms of the, uh, I guess, overall amount of uh, device use and, and how students perceive that, students express that they believe the amount of time they spend using the devices in school is appropriate. Um, though many students do indicate it really does vary by class. Uh, the one exception here are probably high school students. Um, they uh, found that though they do appreciate the devices, uh, they feel that they might be a little bit overused at this point in school. So, um, or on slide 18, excuse me. <laughs> Wrapping up with, uh, based on our findings, talking about our recommendations at this point. Um, so the first recommendation would be to uh, protect the STAT teacher's time as an instructional resource for teachers. Uh, as it was indicated on the survey and that we found through many other data collection activities to this point, um, STAT teachers are very, very valued by teachers as an instructional resource and the time spent doing administrative tasks, um, whether it be helping with park testing or map testing or um, filling in other classrooms, uh, they, they would like that stuff to be minimized so they can maximize the time they spend on instructional time. Um, Providing more professional uh, development opportunities, addressing blended learning, so learning that balances uh, use of technology with that that it's um, more analog uh, is very much valued, and then also professional development on the use of Schoology. Uh, based on teacher feedback from the survey, PD that is focused on one-to-one -one support for teachers is probably the most valuable here, or most valued by teachers, um, particularly that which incorporates opportunities for observation type things. So opportunities for teacher to, uh, teachers to observe other teachers delivering instruction, participation on learning walks, that sorts of thing. And then uh, lastly, to um, our recommendation would be to uh, monitor and proactively address technology glitches as well. So now our final slide, um, our conclusions. So midway through the fifth year of the initiative, it appears that STAT continues to be implemented effectively across BCPS Lighthouse schools and improves the overall learning experiences of BCPS students. Lighthouse classroom teachers continue to hold highly positive perceptions concerning their STAT teachers and feel that the program is playing an integral role in delivering student-centered, technology-driven instruction in their schools. Classroom observation findings, though mostly similar with previous years, did demonstrate some modest evidence of instructional changes. So overall, teachers are making more extensive use of coaching and facilitating than they do of teacher-led presentations. And the most experienced stat classrooms, so cohort one and two classrooms, were also those observed making the most frequent use of higher level questioning techniques, higher order instructional feedback, collaborative learning activities, and flexible group grouping arrangements. Um, so taken in combination, uh, the findings from the data collection activities this fall remain supportive of the conclusion that stat the STAT initiative is well-received and instructionally beneficial program for BCPS. Um, Future research is needed, though, to indicate the degree to which STAT, both separately and in combination with core subject curricula, professional development resources, is associated with substantive long-term achievement gains on some of the achievement assessments. However, as research has demonstrated previously, one should not expect an impact on student achievement from just devices alone. So those are our conclusions at this point. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Mm -hmm. um, I do have some observations. Actually, I have a question first. I just want to clarify, this entire presentation was based on work that you did only with Lighthouse Schools, is that correct? Correct. Okay, because- we include uh, the appendix of the report has, for example, stat teacher program survey results for all uh, teachers in the district. Right. The reason I'm asking that question, um, I have been fortunate to be able to get around to a lot of schools in my district, and I'm not hearing this type of thing from teachers or students. I've been afforded the opportunity when I go to a school to meet with the administrators, then to meet separately with the teachers, and then to meet totally privately with groups of students. And I, I'm not hearing this. Um, and I guess my bigger question is, um, to date, we have spent $460 million on STAT. And I know your last comment referenced academic achievement. And when I look at slides 15 and 16, if I am reading them correctly um, in the cohort four, mm -hmm. does that say that 84.6 um, in 84.6% of the time, collaborative learning was not observed. Uh, for cohort, uh, you're on slide 15, is that correct? Uh, yes. Yep, yes, that is correct. Cohort four. Cohort and then four. in three, 
Correct. Yep. So that's when you're looking at middle school and high school for collaborative learning. Right, um, which is part of the $460 million that we've spent. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to slide 16, um, it concerns me that learning incorporates authentic real world context, um, at least the bottom and top. Um, the numbers are pretty high that that's not observed. Mm -hmm. And $460 million is a lot of money to spend to be able, to not be able to observe those type of behaviors. And I know I'm putting you in a bad <laughs> position, but um, I guess I'm just very concerned about the money we've spent. I am personally concerned about what I see in my area, um, no significant growth in academic achievement. And I guess that's the presentation that you do later. So we'll present on student achievement results when we have the data, which typically comes in the fall for the state assessment. And will you ever um, broaden your assessment of the efficacy of STAT to other than Lighthouse schools? Uh, this was the first year where we solely focused on Lighthouse schools. Okay. So if you would, I mean, with the student achievement reporting that we have done, we've done all the schools in the district. And did you at any point um, read out on the academic achievement um, growth or lack of growth? We, yep, we present on student achievement for the entire district, um, typically in the fall when we have the student achievement data. Okay. Um, let me see if I have any other questions. Hold on. So then, but to address just a couple um, comments that you made, just because I want to make sure we're all on the same page, the observations are just 20 minutes. So. And I'm, I'm only playing devil's advocate. It's not that, you know, I believe either way. Um, so let's say that collaborative learning, we didn't see collaborative learning during the times that we visited. You've got, I think it is important to remember that we were just there for 20 minutes. So it could have happened before or after. I mean, it's not saying that it didn't happen at all in that school day. It's just for those random 20 minutes when we were in a classroom. And I guess for me, anecdotally, when combined with my observations that I make when I visit schools and then the feedback that I get from students, students are brutally honest. Mm -hmm. um, and they're brutally especially honest with when us. they're in I a room, <laughs> um, when there's nobody else there and they feel like they can unload. Yep. And again, my, what I am told is not matching this. So maybe it's an experience in a lighthouse school versus a non lighthouse school. I, I mean, to not, I hate to interrupt you, but I do think that there's something um, fundamentally different about the Lighthouse Schools than it is the rest of the district. You know, they started from the get-go. They were the ones that helped kind of build the program, build the initiative. Um, I think that, I, I could be totally wrong, but I think their professional development, you know, might have been a little bit different, maybe more intensive. So I think they are special in a way. And if we, had, we were talking about spending $460,000, it might be okay to be a little bit different, but we're talking about a half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And I am very concerned about that, especially given the focus on physical sustainability. Um, so I'll shut up now and see if anybody <laughs> else has any questions or comments. Yeah, let, let me kind of jump in a little bit here. So thank you, Ms. Mack, and thank you, Dr. Morrison and Dr. Riley. Um, a couple things, and I certainly understand and respect your point, Ms. Mack, around uh, the cost. I would say a couple things. Uh, one, keep in mind, moving forward, we have been um, in the process of shifting to a less expensive device, which would certainly begin to address uh, some of your concern. I would also like to point out that when we talk about things like collaborative learning, uh, I forget some of the other pieces, much of that is not a function of the device itself. Collaborative learning is a teaching method that goes way back before devices. I'm, I'm sure our educators in the room had professional development on collaborative learning. It was um, very much uh, I know in the 90s, a uh, pedagogical process that was encouraged and supported. So I just want to make a distinction that the device itself does not drive collaborative learning. It is a resource in which when students are doing collaborative work, they can access uh, resources through the device. So I just want to uh, provide some clarity on that. Um, and I forget the real world context. Much of that I know, as Dr. Riley pointed out, cohorts three and four have less experience. And while I understand, again, Ms. Mack, I certainly respect your point around um, the financial return on our investment. I would also uh, point out, as uh, was mentioned, that 
with any practice, the longer professionals have an opportunity to develop that practice, the more skillful and robust and the more um, frequent they use those practices. And cer certainly we can see uh, the cohorts that have had less time uh, with figuring out how do you utilize all the robust aspects of a device to support learning, rather that resources uh, to support vocabulary development in the form of maybe a Kahoot game, or if it's conducting research, or if it's building presentations and pulling in information across multi uh, forms of media or text, uh, using a board builder as one example. The more teachers become exposed and have time to understand how they can leverage this resource to support the content instruction that they were doing, we see um, they become more robust in that. And so I just offer that up that um, we see people have had more time with this are more sophisticated in their use of it, if I may summarize. Um, I'm not one of the researchers, but <laughs> I know firsthand it takes time for people to change their practice. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if we were talking about something that hasn't cost almost a half a billion dollars, um, I might feel differently about it. I too observe students, especially in the world of arts, putting together elaborate presentations. Mm -hmm. And those students were the students who spoke most highly of it. But we're, this is a lot of money. Um, I recently put together uh, an academic achievement scorecard for my district. I have elementary schools where only 17% of my students are reading at grade level. The, those are the students who have had the STAT program the longest. So when I weigh the impact on academic achievement and the expense of this program, I struggle with it, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think, I'm just stating it to you. I know you're not in a position to make decisions. Um, but based on the information that we received, I felt compelled to share my concerns. I think, so you haven't, um, since you're new, you haven't had the pleasure of some of our previous conversations um, <laughs> with the school board. But I think one thing uh, that's, that we've worked hard to help people understand is that devices alone aren't a magic wand, mm -hmm. right? So the best analogy I could think of is, um, cause I have to bake cupcakes this weekend for a wedding. Yeah, so I'm thinking baking. So I'm thinking, um, you know, we uh, perhaps unfortunately inherited a Viking stove, which is like a huge pain, but it's like, okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna use a recipe to make these cupcakes in my Viking stove and I need my friend to help me out. So I'm gonna give her my recipe and she's gonna make these same cupcakes um, in her stove. What are the chances that we're gonna end up with very, very similar tasting cupcakes? Like probably the same thing because the ingredient, the recipe is the same thing. So that's what it comes down to with devices. If I have you write your paper by hand and then write your paper in the computer, chances are good you're gonna end up with the same thing. But what we do have is that technology can change, um, where we, we can leverage the affordances of technology. So technology, the devices are great for things like um, working on a drill and practice and getting individualized feedback. We can use technology for research purposes, which we wouldn't be able to do without devices. But ultimately, what it comes down to is the quality of instruction, so the underlying ingredients in a recipe. But that is also part of my concern. Because of the money that we spent on this program, we could have spent money putting more teachers in classrooms, making class sizes smaller, and they are proven Oh, the research um, strategies. is very mixed on class size. Very, There's, very mixed. <laughs> but getting more teachers in, in the schools, getting more resources in the schools, could also make those cupcakes turn out the same so we actually at a do lesser have, cost. We actually have some um, meta-analyses. So these are um, really high quality, well, not all of them, but the ones that I'm referencing are really high quality reviews of research. So this is where they have a set of standards saying a research study has to employ these methods. The researcher can't design the test. We need to use a state assessment, things like that. There have been more and more publications recently showing the effectiveness of one-to-one -one initiatives. And I have access to a, a research database because I taught, and I could give you 10 things that I pulled that says it harms children. So I guess it looks at the way you look at it. But specifically, and I hate to put you on the spot, I was sent an email about some analysis you did about Dreambox. Mm -hmm. that 
you were involved with. And yep. it's my understanding in your 40 page report, um, after you did a retrospective study for year 14-15, a quasi-experimental evaluation 15-16 in the same and then you did a second cohort of schools in 15 and 16, mm -hmm. that there was not an observed effect on student achievement as measured by MAP and PARC for either cohort one or cohort Correct. two students. Correct. And again, back to the money, we have a spending authority of $3.2 million for Dreambox. We've spent 1.7 million. We have 1.5 million left. And if it was my money, I'd question if I was, why would I spend that money when there has been no effect? So Dreambox, just to clarify, um, Dreambox is a supplementary program. It is incredibly difficult to get a significant effect on achievement when it's used for less than one hour a week, which I believe is what we found, was that it was used for less than one hour a week. But what you do have in terms of Dreambox, and it's, I mean, I know it sounds like that was just last year, the year before that I wrote that report, but I wrote 17 reports since then, so my brain, yeah, can't remember the details. But I do know that the perceptions of Dreambox have always been consistently positive. So if Dreambox might be used in a rotation model, so maybe it's used, you know, in a small group while the teacher's working with another small group, then kids are engaged and kids are enjoying it and they're doing some work and getting some practice. I don't know if that's a bad spend. But I think we're even hearing now in focus groups that kids are talking about how much they like Dreambox. So while you might not have a, sig a statistically significant effect with very little use below the recommended dosage by Dreambox, and I'm not defending Dreambox in any way, shape, or form, um, I don't know if that was a, a bad spend of money. And, and if I could interject yeah, briefly. Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Brown, um, and I'd like to add to the conversation as well. Sure. Um, Certainly respect the, the, the notion of, of being fiscally responsible. And the question about the efficacy of Dreambox, I think, was raised by Mr. Kuhn earlier this year. And um, we had had some discussions with Johns Hopkins about uh, taking a second look at that. Because, again, with the example of a meta analysis, part of the power in, in research is when you can aggregate studies. When you have more than one study that's been done in a topic. Uh, the original, I think, Dreambox evaluation uh, was fairly limited in terms of the sample size. I think there was around 800 kids in the... One of, I remember one of our issues was um, finding equivalent groups because that was when the park um, assessment was transitioning from paper to pencil, so we couldn't add that into the mix and mess muddy up the water, so we had to, like... You know, we knew these schools were using Dreambox, so to find good control schools, we were somewhat limited because they both had to have used the... Pro or done the test online, it which got messy. A it's just bit messy. A, a roundabout way of saying, I th you know, we have worked with Hopkins and they, they're going to do a more comprehensive evaluation of Dreambox uh, involving, uh, I think, all the elementary and middle school students who have used Dreambox this past year. And we expect the results of that evaluation come uh, in July of this year, which would give us plenty of time to make a decision about whether or not we wish to continue with that product in the coming year and would give us um, yeah, having a second evaluation in place uh, would either affirm or, or fail to affirm the, the value of the product moving forward. To the best of your knowledge, are there any pending invoices or any pending um, additional expenses that will be paid out before that comprehensive analysis is complete? I'm not in a position to speak about that. that that's outside my, my will. Because I... Sh yeah. I appreciate what you're saying, that we should take a look at it, but while we're doing that, I don't think we should be spending any more money on it either. Yeah, so I think, uh, Ms. Mack, I, a few things um, uh, while Ms. Shea is taking her seat, because we do want to do our very best to answer your questions. Um, I would also um, point out, as we're all aware here, um, we have been and are actively examining our math resources along with our math curriculum, as well as um, as we get into phase two of our math audit, going into classrooms and seeing how instruction is being implemented. Um, and rather it's Dreambox or our own teacher written curriculum or any other resource that we have for mathematics, I think uh, Dr. Marson raises a great point around implementation and fidelity or not fidelity um, and how is it designed. You know, products are designed and any company will tell you uh, if you implement our product with fidelity, these are the results that we stand by. We often as professionals exercise professional judgment around how we implement um, products. 
and uh, rather that's Dreambox or uh, I'm trying to think of some of the different uh, math kits that we have. So I just offer that up for us as a group to recognize that, um, again, implementing with fidelity may be different than how we are implementing. Um, and I just say that as information and clarity to, to think critically here, because again, Ms. Mack, I certainly respect your point. Um, Ms. Shea can speak to where we are currently. I was just going to give a quick answer to your mm -hmm. question about um, the timeline that Dr. Brown just shared in terms of this evaluation would line up before we would spend any additional funds. So that would be a part of that decision and, and actually um, would help with that decision because I think I also want to echo the point about um, what that purchase does in a classroom in terms of providing teachers that opportunity. And we've talked a lot about teachers having um, lots of different things going on in a classroom at once. So all of that would be, so just a direct answer to your question, there would be no spend between now and when we had that um, result. Yeah, that timing works out perfectly for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and if we can, I, it's not that I want to shut the conversation around Dreambox, but we did come to talk about the STAT evaluation. Dreambox is a supplemental resource for math and is one example of a digital tool or resource. So I should say resource, not tool. Okay. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask a question regarding the overuse in classrooms, because every time I talk to a student, or even in my schoolhouse and out of it, they're fans of the devices. The devices, it literally makes life easier. But of course, we come up with the problems with technical issues. And we've talked about it all year. We're still having a conversation. We're working with the technical team to work on those technical issues. But then with the overuse in classrooms, what I hear students say is just more professional development. We acknowledge that if our teachers were equipped with more skills and more professional development on how to properly implement mm -hmm. the devices, there would be a whole shift. So I want, I, I often come back to the idea, I understand we spent so much money on the devices, but it's also like an iPhone and an adult. So an iPhone and an adult, my mother, she will spend all that money to buy the latest iPhone, but she won't use the iPhone to its fullest cap capabilities. She'll still be showing up to late. late. She will still show up to work late. She will still forget things because she's not using her reminders. She's not using her calendars, but she spent over $1,000 on that phone. So I feel as if we spent all that money on the devices and it just takes us properly implementing it so that professional development is something that I just want to see rise in the upcoming You bring up a, a good point and it, I was actually reading like perhaps one of my most favorite journal articles ever to, to this afternoon um, and it was talking about implementation fidelity which is what you're talking about right like the district had this vision for how they wanted stat to be implemented in the schools and I think what you're seeing in our observation results is like maybe things aren't happening the way that they should be so if we don't have full implementation according to fidelity, like if I'm using the prescription my doctor prescribed me completely not the way I should, then how do I expect it to cure whatever I'm taking it for? So this, I think the same thing could be happening with STAT, particularly when you look at our observation results, given that they're just a snapshot. It could be that what the district designed to have happen isn't 100% what's happening in the classrooms. Doesn't mean that STAT didn't work, doesn't mean that STAT can't work and have a stronger impact, but it might need to look more into professional development. Thank you, and thank you. Um, I, I listened to what Ms. Adekoya said, and um, as an educator, and having gone through all of my schools on each of the levels, uh, I've seen or gotten feedback very differently uh, from Mrs. Mack. However, I do understand the concern about the amount of money, but I think everything that we need to consider is right here in the presentation and possibly um, around what you just said, that we are looking at the devices as it that they are going by themselves, any of the devices or any of the other things that we use um, in the classrooms as the only thing that will make a difference in terms of scores that are, that are going to give us that answer that we all look for. Mm -hmm. But I think if we look at the recommendations slide, you get a wealth of information from there, and it was just said, 
In some schools, it's done exceedingly well because maybe the stat teachers are more seasoned mm -hmm. and they've had more professional development. They have more understanding of how to use the devices and the opportunities. I've watched children who clearly have been um, guided to the point that they know how to do certain things for their growth on their own. They don't always have to wait for instruction because it has been ingrained in them. So they know when to get up and do something else. They know when to put down the device and pick up a book. They know when to go to a board and do something with little or next to no instruction until it's time to have that instruction. But teachers are also saying, uh, I, I saw in your slide that they want to see, have more opportunities for more one-to-one -one with other teachers and other teachers who understand some new ideas. So I, I see the money here, and that's something, I, it's so big, it's hard for me to even wrap my head around mm -hmm. it. But when I see what it's capable of giving us when you take the devices, and we're getting ones that are, are less expensive, but take devices and help children and teachers to understand how to blend it all, mm -hmm. then we will see the differences. Because I've seen school, gone to schools and, and watched them handle material. And I know that if past testing hasn't spoken to where they are or where they were, when we test them again, I believe we will see different things. I see the excitement and the opportunities, the good writing, the good speaking, in what they do and how they manipulate all of the pieces. And I think that's what we wanted. No one wanted to just give a child a device and say, go forth into the world and make excellence happen. So I, I, I do think we need to give a great deal of consideration to these recommendations and, and the things that people are actually saying about the pluses and the negatives. Good afternoon. Hi. On slide 17 with student perceptions of STAT, did, describe that again. How did you get the students? To, did, were there five students in each class? or? So how, it's a, it's, so it's a complicated process logistically. <laughs> the, um, so we randomly select the schools because you know, we can't have every school in the district participate in focus groups and they would probably get mad at us. So we randomly select some schools. We ask the schools to submit parental consents. So they, have, they send home a letter with the students. The ones that come back that say, yes, I agree to have my kid participate in a focus group will randomly, it's like drawing names out of a hat. We'll select some from the ones that are returned to participate in a focus group. Okay, that that seems random enough. Not to me. biased. <laughs> I was thinking that you know teachers gave you those five kids, and I was going to say that wouldn't be very. We good. try as best as we can to keep everything on the up and up. Yeah, <laughs> and how about do you? I bet you do. Uh, do you have a slide with faculty perceptions of that? Did I miss that? Um, Is there? An, so we have. Uh, let's see. Something similar to 17, but from that's, the faculty? That's, that's a preview that's of it. results. Um, so we have, we have the survey that BCPS administers that's about the stat teacher, so classroom teacher's perception of the stat teacher. We have finished conducting principal interviews, um, classroom teacher interviews, which are, again, are very rare, stat teacher interviews this spring. So that'll come in our next report. Yeah, keep in mind this is the mid-year report, so this is really you are wrapping up the, this information all the way, you're working on that all the way through the end of January, early February, yes. that yes. first semester, and part of what she, you're asking about will be in the end of year, so they do those portions in the spring. Okay, and, and I know collection of survey data is, is difficult. <laughs> do you have, what, what kind of percentage did you get back? So I don't, so this report we're presenting on is Baltimore County's survey, um, but I like where you're going here. So with our survey. I'm not sure where I'm going here. Okay, so well, <laughs> um, the survey that we administer in the spring, so we'll administer our own questionnaire. We designed it. Um, and I press my staff like this guy to go for getting at least 70% of teachers to
bond. Wow. Because anything less than that, I worry about the trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I must be honest and say I didn't fill out the Baltimore County survey. And I was in a lighthouse school. You probably school. heard their, yeah, yeah, you heard the response rate. And that, yeah, we were probably harassing you with emails saying, like, please complete this. We got a lot of them. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of concerning it didn't have an effect, but that's okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have more questions, but I do want to just offer this for our board members. I certainly recognize the concern around the financial uh, return on investment. I ask that you think about as we move forward as a whole community around this idea of leveraging technology to support learning. And that we think clearly about is our concern the money? Is our concern how we use technology to support uh, learning? Uh, because there, uh, while which resources we pick influence the dollar amount. Is the concern the dollar amount or is the concern technology? Because we as um, educators do not and have not ever said that it's about putting kids in front of a device nonstop all day, but that it's about leveraging the efficiency and the robust capability that uh, device could offer us as educators in our work with kids. Um, and I will tell you as an educator, what I wish I had when I was a classroom teacher was the ability to pull together truly differentiate resources for my students. The logistics of trying to provide authentic differentiation for my students was not feasible quite frankly, as a high school teacher with 150 students, to be able to provide resources rich in content at various reading levels to students uh, to support conceptual understanding and critical reasoning was logistically not feasible. And, and without, I didn't have a device. I didn't have that capability. The efficiency that that provides us um, is something worth considering, and I, again, I'm not debating this idea of wanting to be financially responsible. I just encourage us to think clearly about what it is that, is it the money and that we're not against this idea of leveraging technology to support learning, or is it that we're against the idea of technology to support learning and the money helps justify uh, the elimination, because I think we're sophisticated, and I think when we look at w what college students are expected to do, professionals in the environment, uh, I went to have some automotive work done, and the first thing the automotive gentleman did was hook it up to a technology diagnostic um, apparatus. And so I just want us to be very thoughtful about getting to the place where we are being financially responsible, and we're also not um, dismissing the opportunity to use technology to support our teaching and, and learning process. And I just ask that we consider that as we move forward, because it's, all, it's a journey together. I just have a comment to that. Mm -hmm. um, again, I spent a better part of the weekend putting together a scorecard for my area, all, every school at every level. And it, it's, I'm, I never make decisions just about money, mm -hmm. but when I look at my scorecard and I c live in an area where education is perceived as being solid education, in my elementary schools, I have a, no, my district average is less than 40% proficiency in third fourth and fifth grade ELA and math. Mm -hmm. So it is not just about money to me, but it's about the return on investment. If these numbers were higher, we wouldn't be having this conversation mm -hmm. because I would say we are obviously spending our money wisely and driving academic achievement. Mm -hmm. But I have trended the academic achievement and it's not going up, it's going slightly down. Mm -hmm. So we're spending a half a billion dollars to have our academic achievement go down it concerns me greatly. Yeah, well, I certainly am concerned about our achievement as well, and I would agree that we have a lot of work to do, and that our technology is not a silver bullet, and that much of that gets back to supporting our teachers in terms of professional development, 
planning, understanding text complexity. There's a lot that goes into that. You know, we were just discussing reading in detail, and we'll be uh, discussing math in more detail as time um, goes on. Um, so there is a lot of elements that go into that, Ms. Mack, and I certainly would agree that we need to be critical and that we want to see greater results for our students. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. OK, thank you. I think that concludes this portion of tonight's agenda. And we'll see you back for the end of year report in the fall. Thank you. OK, while they're um, moving, we're going to move on to um, Ms. Shea. If you could come forward. We have. Um, um, our next item of business is really an item for approval. Uh, we are requesting permission to do a name change for some of our world language uh, courses. And at that, I'll have Ms. Shea go ahead and pick sure. up. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon. You'll probably remember, at, I think it was our first new curriculum committee meeting when I brought um, a packet about all the f what we call phase form changes. So this was the chart that listed new courses that we were creating, chart. courses maybe that we were dropping, or courses okay. that we were changing names. Folder. So um, this is just a, a late time addition to, to catch up with that other group. So um, in our world language courses um, at the middle school level, um, we currently are course course names are titled with the language and then the grade level. So we have Spanish grade 6, Spanish grade 7, Spanish grade 8, and then we have the same for French, for Chinese, and for Latin. What we're proposing, what has been brought to our attention from teachers, really this came from teachers, um, and what they shared with us was our um, world language courses at the middle school level um, do have what we call tiered instruction. World language acquisition is developmental, and so the courses are designed that you can have um, students that have different levels of proficiency or understanding in that same course, and there's opportunities for differentiation, um, which is why they were aligned to grade levels. And that will still be true for the majority of students that that's appropriate. What the teachers shared with us um, that has become a challenge um, is really falls into two areas. Having the grade level associated makes it a challenge when you have students who move into our school system that have no experience with world language, because rather than it being about the level of language, it's aligned to their grade level. So for example, students who move into our school district new in eighth grade and have maybe come from a district that has no world language instruction would be placed in grade eight Spanish, which is at an intermediate level because it's assuming they've participated in grade six and grade seven. But the idea of scheduling an eighth grader into a course that's called grade six, as you can imagine, has an impact on the student and on their family because it feels as if they're um, not having that option. So so um, the second incident that incidence of this that has come up is for some of our students who've participated in reading intervention. And we've talked a lot about our students, and we're going to talk again about a population of students we're supporting. When they exit reading intervention, which is a huge success story and what we want, we want them to have an opportunity to begin world language instruction, but not feel like they have to go into a different grade level. So what the teachers um, and our world language office has worked with is to change those course names so that they reflect the level of proficiency. So what we're proposing is that Spanish grade six would become, and this would be true for French and then Chinese and Latin as well, would become beginner Spanish level A. Um, the course formerly known as Spanish grade seven would become beginner Spanish level B, and Spanish grade eight would become intermediate Spanish. This would allow schools the flexibility to maybe cross grade level. So we could have a class of beginner level A that might include sixth, seventh, or eighth grade students, which is pretty typical for some of our other like arts classes or some of the other um, music classes, so to speak. So we're really aligning it with that model of instruction. So it would not change anything in terms of of, um, the majority of students would still progress in this way, but that name change, and so it's not changing curriculum, it's not changing staffing, it's simply that name change allows schools to have the flexibility to serve students in that way. Does anybody have any discussion or questions? I'm a little curious about the passport program mm -hmm. and how those kids, yep. with this change, if those kids are, are 
somewhat more proficient, mm -hmm. could then they jump into the beginner Spanish uh, level B? So or, or, or would potentially, yes. I mean, potentially, yes. So what I will share with you is that um, remember that the passport program, the amount of Spanish instruction they have isn't the same as um, like a full year where they have Spanish every day or every other day, because in many cases, it's one time a week with a teacher within that um, ongoing practice. So it is possible. The beginner Spanish level A course does allow for differentiation. So you, within that curriculum, teachers have what we call tiered activities. So there are activities and supports in there for students who have never spoken a word of Spanish. But there are also opportunities for students who have some background in Spanish, students in the passport program, or perhaps students who come from another district that have had some exposure. Um, but we do hope to move towards a place where students who maybe are demonstrating proficiency would be more appropriately scheduled in that level B, that that could be an option. And by removing that grade level um, constraint, if you will, we believe that could happen. What will go along with that, and if you'll remember from our budget request, um, we're hoping to put in proficiency assessments to help teachers with those placement recommendations. Um, we don't believe that it's appropriate to assume having passport one day a week for two years means you can skip a year. But we also recognize for some students, they may have a natural acquisition and be ready for that. Um, what we're moving towards specifically at the middle school level first is to have an assessment to help teachers make those recommendations. Um, so what was a really long answer is it could be possible and this would allow for that. It's not an automatic, though. So I don't want to send the message that if you've had passport, you would automatically have enough um, proficiency to skip it, but it could be possible. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. I have just a curiosity question. Sure. Um, do students who take world languages use headphones and work with a computer to listen to a native? Yep. So. Um, Yes, there are opportunities for that. So the Middlebury program, which is, has been a part of Passport Elementary, has that component. But our authentic resources that are built into the World Languages curriculum at middle and high school does have an opportunity for students to um, hear heritage speakers having authentic conversations, to watch clips that would include um, some video opportunities so that they're engaging in that. And we have, at the World Language Office, we have provided schools with headsets that also have microphones, since we also are trying to increase speaking, um, so that they would have that opportunity to even record themselves having um, that opportunity. And do our teachers who teach these languages, French, Chinese, Latin, they're obviously proficient in the language? Yes, so okay. they're, um, for that certification, they would have to reach okay. a certain level of proficiency. All right, thank you. Sure. Oh, I just wanted to comment that I really think this is nice because you have those students who may be in beginner Spanish level A but are excelling and thriving, mm -hmm. but they're slowed down because they're still with that cohort. So this allows for that middle school flexibility, yes. which is which enables them to feel confident in their proficiency in language sure. speaking. And like I said, we're grateful to our teachers that brought this to our attention. And that's really important, that partnership, because they said, we understand. And again, the majority, that will be the way they progress. But um, they wanted us to be able to provide that flexibility for students to have that measure of success. I just want to say bravo. This, this is really what was missing, mm -hmm. um, because it does give students an opportunity to mix it up without having that angst about where Stigma, they are. sure. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. really important for middle schoolers, <laughs> all kids. But. Any other questions or concerns? Can we take a vote? All in favor of the change? Anyone Thank opposed? You. Okay. Thank you, and uh, just uh, for general purposes, we will be bringing forward to the full board, I think it's in May, I'm not sure which date in May, I think it's the, it, it's in May, the uh, entire list that you saw in January, which was our first curriculum, this will be part of that list, uh, just, and then when we get to that point, I'll remind you again, but just so that you see those pieces will come together. Typically, we bring everything in one batch uh, in January. This was really brought forward, as Ms. Shea said, at the request of our teachers, and we still had time to get it caught up to the batch, um, and so you'll see that coming forward, the whole list that you had reviewed previously, along with these, these, this name change.
So thank you. Um, okay, so thank you. Our next um, item of business here, we have um, Dr. Wisted and Ms. Ryder and Ms. Shea are here to um, bring forward visualizing and verbalizing. These are also instructional resources that you'll see coming forward to the whole board um, for a consideration and approval. Right. And, um, and I'll let them we're back so up. We're back. We're back. We're back. Yeah, our technology is, is perfect timing. Yes, yeah, so really we are come back to up. Life Thank here. you. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon. Um, we are going to pick up where we left off last time with our demonstration about reading. If you remember, we talked about Scarborough's rope, and you all indulged me. And Miss Pastor, I'm so grateful that you still have our manipulatives. You do as well. Yeah, Great. Wonderful, perfect. So that's exactly we're going to pick up where we left off um, because we even mentioned, so I won't belabor this idea, but if you remember, we talked about those two areas of the main areas of that rope being around this idea of decoding versus um, comprehension. And this is what we call the simple view of reading. Again, the ultimate purpose of teaching students to read is so that they can gain meaning and learn. Um, and so Again, um, using those manipulatives, we talked about those different strands of the rope and how each of those represents a different area of the brain engaged and a different part of reading and that our job and the work that we've done in partnership with um, special education in ELA is to really help teachers have the tools they need to diagnose which part of that pipe cleaner came loose and then what's the appropriate instructional recommendation. For today's conversation, we're gonna be specifically focusing on that area of comprehension. And we talked about how um, an area of that rope in that language comprehension is that we need our students to be able to become increasingly strategic at making meaning. Um, and so part of being able to decode words is actually then to be able to understand what they mean, to put those words together in a sentence. Um, and if you remember, we also talked about these four quadrants, and we talked about how oftentimes reading failure falls in one of these four quadrants, but the conversation um, that we had last time was really about that this is not an either-or conversation, it's a both-and. We wanna make sure that we are um, building a skill set for our students so that we have strong decoding and strong comprehension so that we have skillful readers. This illustrates, if you remember, we talked about what would happen if we went all Orton Gillingham taught all phonics and we had phenomenal phonics without addressing comprehension. Um, and, and we don't wanna do that. We wanna have that balance. We're really proud of the work we've done with our explicit phonics, um, but we know that instruction in comprehension is critical to make sure that all of our students end up in this target area where they have both strong decoding and strong comprehension and are ready for whatever um, we send their way in terms of text for making meaning. If on the bottom right-hand quadrant, you'll remember we talked about there is a population of students, um, readers, who have very strong decoding. And I think, Ms. Mack, you even talked about students you've encountered where they sound great. And then they get to the end, they have no idea what they read. Um, and this is an area of challenge that's very distinct and very specific. And so tonight, what we're going to be talking about is our um, proposed solution, the, the um, resources that we hope to procure to address this particular population of readers. Um, you'll remember last time we also talked about this idea of a movie in your mind. I believe Mr. McMillian was reading about the bubble gum and how it can improve focus. And we talked about that as you read in text, um, um, readers that are strong readers um, are making that movie in their mind. They're actually visualizing what happens in text, both through listening comprehension when a teacher is reading aloud, but also when they're reading printed word. Um, this is important for vocabulary development, for language comprehension, and it's also really important for written expression. Really, the way that we measure what students understand is what they're able to communicate, both through their written communication and their oral um, language response. And so comprehension really engages is both sides of that brain because we have a need for our students to be able to visualize, so making that movie in their mind as they're reading or as they're listening, um, but then also to be able to express and verbalize what it is they understood. Um, as we mentioned last time and in that quadrant we pointed to, for some of our students that projector is broken. It's not actually showing them in their mind what is happening. That movie isn't playing, and so then they get to the end of that reading and they fall 
fall in this quadrant where they're able, they understand the sound structure of language and that sound symbol correspondence. They're able to word call, but they struggle with comprehension. This historically has been a population that's a little bit harder to diagnose because when you think about primary grades, when some of the text is more simple or there's a lot of picture cueing, um, our students are able to fake it till they make it. They're able to make meaning and, and, and hang with us because they sound really good. And so when a teacher asks them to read aloud, it sounds like, yes, this child is doing a good job reading. And oftentimes in, in um, earlier texts or primary grades, the text is simple enough that with a picture cue, um, and these children are very bright, they're able to make some meaning. But they come to a wall. They come to a point where the fact that that movie player is no longer working begins to significantly impact their comprehension. And as that text gets more complex, and we're using that text to make meaning in science and social studies and CTE courses um, that challenge this um, particular area of um, challenge where they're not able to make that conceptual image causes reading failure. And so that's really what we're here to address is this specific population of students um, with the researchers and professional development that we would propose to help support those readers. So with that, I'm going to turn that over to Ms. Ryder for the specifics. And I think how we actually um, started our afternoon together wasn't planned, but I think it was perfect for what we're talking about today, because as we had the technology issue and there was um, inability at that point to project the presentations, at that point, um, if we didn't have the flash drives and the visuals in front of us, mm -hmm. we would have been left to just have to visualize what the speakers were saying. So I felt like it led perfectly into our, <laughs> into our presentation today. Um, with that being said, though, we were very fortunate to be um, highlighted the last Board of Education meeting with the STAR video. And during that highlight, it was really capturing the partnership that we have between the Offices of Special Education and the Office of English Language Arts. And we've worked really um, diligently. We're very proud of the partnership that we have because we're constantly looking at ways in which we can be fiscally responsible and maximizing our fiscal resources and braiding our funds together. What are ways that we can also maximize our resources in regards to the provision of professional development? How can our offices collaborate to support the professional development and learning and the coaching opportunities for our reading specialists, our general education teachers, and our special education teachers. We've um, worked very hard to make sure that we were addressing those foundational reading skills um, through the provision of training at the Letters Training and the Orton Gillingham. And then the next step that we have in our partnership is really addressing this area of literacy that is a need for our students, which is comprehension. Um, we did engage, our offices engage in the process to request and select instructional materials and that was in accordance and as, out, as outlined in policy and rule 6002. So we reviewed a variety of materials and um, the group, it was a diverse panel, selected those materials of which is visualizing and verbalizing, which is by Linda Mood Bell. Um, these materials were also placed on public display for a time period and uh, coincidentally it was the same time that we had our CCAC, CCAC meeting, meeting. <laughs> um, for our special education citizens advisory and the topic for that meeting was literacy. So the timing of that was perfect. And um, not only did the teachers and stakeholders have an opportunity to comment on the materials that were placed on public display, but we actually had teachers here that evening, some of which have used components of visualizing and verbalizing in their classrooms. And um, we had groups of reading specialists, special education teachers, administrators here presenting that night at CCAC, and they were thrilled to hear and to see that we had those materials as something that we were proposing to move forward. Um, visualizing and verbalizing is, is an evidence-based intervention um, tool, and it is, again, it's a tool for our teachers to use, as we want to add more tools in the toolbox for our teachers, add more menus and options of which our teachers can use. We are looking at this program um, because it does benefit many students at all levels. Um, it is mostly used with students who have learning dis um, difficulties, learning disabilities, students with autism, and those with dyslexia. And we have a few of those. Yeah, around. sure. Yeah, thank you. And these are not, um, do not appear as interactive as the materials that you saw last time because these are more for the teachers to use, not so much as for the students to use. So why visualizing and verbalizing? Much as um, Ms. Shea shared, that it's really um, a weakness that some of our students have that they may be able to read really well, but they're not able to form that imagery inside their minds. So what um, visualizing and verbalizing, it's really able to create that mental image of the verbal and the visual spatial representation systems, and you're able to take something that seems abstract and make it into something that's concrete. 
Visualizing, verbalizing, it develops concept and imagery, creating that um, gestalt from language and as a basis for comprehension and also for higher order thinking. The program is developed to explicitly teach students how to create that visual image inside of his or her mind. I can think about this with um, as a former teacher where you would have that child in the classroom and as Ms. Shea has talked about, where you think they understand everything that they're reading. They read so fluently, but they're not able to describe what they've read. Uh, my own child, he does have autism and he's a fast reader and he skips over half the words he's reading. I, and I think, wow, that sounds really good at the end, but he's not able to go back and necessarily demonstrate or talk about what he read. So by uh, um, giving this tool to our teachers, they're able to explicitly teach students how to stop and think about what they're reading while they're reading, using some um, background experiences to help them think about the context of the words that they're reading, so that way they can make meaning of what is read. Um, again, this is a critical um, classroom skill, and it helps our students not only with reading, but also with memory, um, also with vocabulary, critical thinking, and also with writing. It's taught in a very systematic way. Um, there are structure words, which looks like the large cards, which it really are key words that the teacher would use, um, as, such as what? Think about size, think about color, think about shape. Where is this happening? What type of movement do you envisualize? What is the mood? What is the background? And getting um, students to think about those key words helps them to really think about or put that image in their mind so they can understand what they're reading. It starts off again in a very systematic way where we're really just working picture by picture. And then the teacher would move after a child is able to really create that visual and talk about it to verbalize what they're able to see. Um, then it would move to more word imaging then it would move to sentence imaging, sentence by sentence imaging, sentence by sentence with interpretation, and multiple sentences, and then it would move on to paragraph and complete text. So it's a very systematic way, and we're teaching our students how to think about what they're reading so that way they can make, um, make meaning of what they read. So what we would be proposing would include Sorry, it would help if I move to it. Mm -hmm. um, the contract that we would be proposing would be a comprehensive contract in the fact that it would allow for us to um, have contracted services with consultants who would provide that level of training to our teachers. So we would be working with a consultant because this is a specialized type of intervention that you have to conduct, you, we have to have a um, training for it. The teachers would participate in the training and we'd also allow um, opportunities for coaching as well um, with our teachers. Sometimes it's not enough just to receive the um, training in a face-to-face -face type of professional development, but by also um, aligning that with support in the classroom and helping teachers to guide them with the instruction and the application of what they've learned is helpful. So in addition to the training piece, it would also include the kit. And inside of the kit, there are a variety, um, I have a kit back here, but there's a variety of tools that the teacher could use um, because it is a very fluid program and it starts for some at that very picture level and for others we move all the way up to that paragraph level. So it would have a variety of tools that the teacher could use based upon um, the child's needs and they could be fluid with that process. The kit again includes manuals um, and it also includes picture to picture easel books, folders, structure word cards, word imaging books, sentence by sentence um, structures, also includes some manipulatives, um, and also includes stories and posters that the teachers can use with their students. It would be our goal for our first year to ensure that we would have representation in all of our elementary schools to participate in the training, and they would also receive the materials and the kits for each of our elementary schools would be our year one of our program. And very similar to the letters training in the Orton-Gillingham, we have the lofty goal to make sure that we have everyone trained at the elementary level first. We want to start with that prevention, but then also in the years, the subsequent years, we want to make sure that we are also sustaining that level of training and also increasing the level of training to, um, to our middle school and then also for some of identified schools where we have some programs with students with autism. Okay, so any questions? I do have some questions. I think you answered some of them, but when I look at this thing, I imagine myself being the teacher mm -hmm. and these questions are on the back. Mm -hmm. Am I working with one student or am I working with a classroom of students. Yeah. And it depends, um, it can vary. Ideally, it would be with a small group or it could be an individual student as well. Do we have any statistics on what percent of our students fall into that lower right-hand quadrant of, of 
I had mm -hmm. it up here somewhere. Strong um, decoding and poor comprehension. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to speak to the statistics about students with autism? We don't collect data. Um, all of the students fall under the same classifications in their IEP, um, typically under specific learning disability or students with autism. So we don't then break that down further. Um, and that larger category is because of that's how it's outlined in IDEA. Sure. So of that, I can give a, a few numbers, not saying that all of these students right. would have it, um, but we do have, um, of the 15,319 students that we have with disabilities, we do have 30% of that population um, are coded with having a specific learning disability. Many of those students who have been identified to have a specific learning disability, reading um, is also an area of need. It could be within the it could also be within the comprehension. Students, um, dyslexia is not necessarily a disability own, coding. Right. It would fall under specific learning disability. So some of our students who have 504 plans or IEPs under that 30% would potentially benefit from a program as such. Um, we do have students with autism. We have 12% of that um, 15,319 students do have um, autism. And some of them on um, the autism is a spectrum. So we do have some students or in the higher end um, who are reading really well and are able to decode well, but then comprehension, and I don't want to say it for all of our students, but generally speaking for students with autism who do have strong decoding skills, they lack because of the language deficits that they may have, those social kind of connections, they're not able to always make that um, image inside their mind. That's generally for some of our students with higher functioning autism, that is usually where their area of weaknesses. So who is the typical teacher that will take advantage of this? Special ed only or? We would anticipate that the training would be for special education and reading specialists. Oh, okay. um, but then we would also engage principals because oftentimes our principals identify a teacher leader in one of the primary grades. So it wouldn't be restricted. And we really think the best approach is when there's a balance and a team. Um, so we would hope, we would start by asking the principals to help us identify because in some buildings it is the special educator. Sometimes it's the reading specialist. Um, and then in some cases it might be a classroom teacher. More likely it would be the reading specialist or um, special educator because this is so specialized and would probably fall under um, a small group opportunity. Um, but it's not restrictive in that. And way. will we trial it before we fully deploy it? So in terms of a pilot, in terms pilot. of, yeah, so um, yes and no. We would not want to withhold it um, from any population of students, but in terms of um, whether or not then we continue with, like um, Ms. Ryder talked about, expanding to middle school or um, double kits in some elementary schools that are larger, then yes, we would wait and use that initial round to um, gather some data about the statistics for those students. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Education is hard. It's just, it sure is. <laughs> it's really complex and it's always so interesting. When I saw the brain idea, I was trying to remember the parts of my brain, the sure. parietal, frontal, and it's, and then the, the coding and all, it's just so, just to sit down, it's very complex teaching children and you get so older, you think that it happened overnight and That's you don't right. understand the complexity of mm -hmm. students that fall behind, whether in visualizing or verbalizing and I just think that these tools are amazing. And I wonder, so how will we gauge the effectiveness mm -hmm. of these tools in the actual classroom or with the students? It's a great question. So, go ahead, you wanna start first? And there's a, a variety of ways in which we would um, wanna make sure that we're evaluating the outcome and the effectiveness of this. One way and one measurement that we would use would be for um, progress towards goals in an IEP. We would anticipate that comprehension would be an area as identified um, as a goal or objective on a particular student's IEP. When we've worked with um, some of our teachers, such as those with the Orton-Gillingham, then we are able to look or um, we're able to examine the IEP actual IEPs of students to see if we're seeing progress over a period of time. Just to give you kind of a statistic, as of March, we had, um, of our students in K-5, 3,666 students in elementary kids with IEP who had reading comprehension noted. So that's an, a, an area of which we would make sure that we are working with our special education teachers, especially after they've had the training, to ensure that we have goals and objectives that we would see an improvement um, in the development of those, and then we would able to be uh, able to monitor students' progress towards those goals and objectives. So that's a very specific data point that we could capture. Whenever we also offer um, opportunities for coaching, um, very similar to when we had the BCBA that was here recently, we talk about um, something called like a fidelity checklist or a fidelity tool. 
part of that coaching opportunity would be for that coach to make sure that we are implementing whatever um, the intervention is with fidelity. So we would also use those type of checklists to um, evaluate outcomes as well for the implementation of that within the schools. And then I would just add a third piece. We always engage our teachers in gathering that feedback in terms of effectiveness. And so some of this is about having systematic and explicit materials. Teachers have been trying to fill in holes around comprehension forever. This is giving them an evidence-based systematic approach to how to build those layers, as Ms. Ryder talked about, from the word to the sentence to the paragraph. So I think another piece that we would be measuring would be um, teachers and engaging them in providing us feedback with um, the effectiveness of their own practice in terms of how they're able to address those IEP um, goals and needs, but also meet standards. So I would also hope for some of our students that their um, scores on some of the curriculum-based assessments where comprehension has been a factor Right, They were strong decoders and maybe even have some good background knowledge, but the comprehension in text-based comprehension would weaken. So that would be another data point. Um, we try to encourage, that's why I said before, we really like that team approach because you often need multiple data sources to help you really build that profile for our students of, of how they're doing. And how does the rollout of this look? Are, we, are you sitting all of your special educators in um, an auditorium and... Or so, are you sending people yeah. out to schools to work? I mean, how does both, it look? So both, right? Yeah. You want to start? So for the first part, when um, it's a two-day type of uh, workshop or training that would be provided for teachers, that would be outside of the school. And we will offer multiple opportunities because we want to ensure that we have options for our teachers and they're not taking too many teachers out at one time. So we would anticipate that that would be offered, hopefully if approved, at the onset of the school year within the first um, few months. So that way we can ensure that all of our teachers go through that training. The coaching follow-up would actually occur in the schools, School, right. um, and that's where we would work um, across our offices and strategically, strategically to determine what that support or uh, that um, on-site coaching would look like. So it's a combination approach with the face-to-face -face PD and then the on-site right. support. We, we schools. smiled when you said all in one room because it would be faster if we could put them all. No, but it I know, would be and that's multiple. why I asked. Like, yes, what was? it would be multiple. So typically we offer over the span of a week several different opportunities, and that way principals work with their staff to schedule it around other things happening in the building. Um, sometimes principals like for their reading specialist, special education, to go together and so that they have that partnership sometimes they say I can't afford to have them both out of the building so I'm gonna send one this two-day training and one the following week and we allow them to have those options okay thank you sure um, maybe this is more of a, a comment um, than a question I don't know but I always like these things, not because you, you bring it before us, it's <laughs> automatically a given, but, and, and I think Dr. Uh, uh, McComas would also agree with this, having been a school administrator, that when you can get anything mm -hmm. in a building mm -hmm. that is going to help, help. a population, mm -hmm. you process how it might help other populations Absolutely. for uh, whom you didn't necessarily purchase it, it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. or individual students who might fall into the abyss and, and then suddenly you say, that's how I can ha mm -hmm. help this child. So when you think about the amount of money that you're spending on something, you can multiply it by all of the other opportunities. Mm -hmm. Halima just asked about the other ones. Could this be a lesson plan? Mm -hmm. And so you can yeah. mm -hmm. you can pull these things, even though it, it's earmarked for a group, and actually use them Absolutely. in some ways, pieces or whole, mm -hmm. to help other children who might not fall into one of the catchment right. areas. But that does bring a question up. So if you're training the reading specialist and the special educators, but the situation Ms. Pestier just outlined, is it in grade level meetings that people say, hey, I have this student who just doesn't seem to be able to have great comprehension? Would your expectation, expectation be that the reading specialist or the special educator would say, Perhaps yep. just, okay. Exactly. So we talked um, at the last presentation too. A part of our work that we started with probably four or five years ago now was around some diagnostic 
that we give to our students to help teachers identify where's the weakness. Um, so some of that helps drive that, but then also the regular grade level planning and data meetings, those are the opportunities that teachers say, somebody help me, I don't know what to do with Tom. You know, Tommy's really struggling, I see this, and that's where we would expect, and that's an expectation we have of reading specialists, special educators anyway, in terms of that aspect of coaching and their job around how they are experts and have these specialized degrees to support classroom teachers with meeting those needs. So that would be a pretty typical way that that would happen. Um, but part of what I also want to piggyback, what we found from our teachers with other program materials, is sometimes it is embedded PD. Just the structure of the lesson, they're like, well, I can use that when I'm teaching mm -hmm. a comprehension lesson in the curriculum based because that structure helps me as a teacher figure out that sequence. Um, so that has always often been an added benefit whenever we bring a structured approach. And again, reading specialists, special educators, in some cases the stat teacher may be involved in planning some of that professional learning um, as we work with um, principals around identifying goals in their school progress plan, um, something like this in their building would also help them to be able to identify that professional learning need for the staff as a whole mm -hmm. as well. Another opportunity would be what we call our student support team. So before students are identified with special education needs, there's a team that comes together where a teacher may say, you know, and, and they're bringing in formal data to say they're really struggling in this one area and I'm out of ideas and, and the group brainstorms strategy. So that's another time where it might come up. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so this is one that we would need a vote on. This is for approval to move forward or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, and so Dr. Wisted and Ms. Ryder will stay and we're going to move into um, interpreting services for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And again, this is a contract. Hi. Yes, and Ms. Townsend is yes. going to be joining us. She is our coordinator of related services, which deaf and hard of hearing and, and those um, services that go along with it are under her office. Good evening. Good evening, good to see you. And we're, you we're just gonna give really a general overview of um, what the interpreting services are used for within Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Okay. So we'll just start off with two definitions, um, one of which is deafness. Deafness is a hearing impairment that is so severe that the child is impaired in processing <laughs> linguistic information through hearing, with or without amplification that adversely affects a child's educational performance. Um, when we're talking about students with disabilities um, who, I, who I have deafness as a, identified, um, we are talking about currently 15 students in Baltimore County Public Schools, which equates to about 0.1% of that 15,319 um, count that I shared with you earlier. For hearing impairment, an, he an impairment in hearing, whether permanent or fluctuating, that adversely affects a child's educational performance, but that is not included under the definition of deafness. And the current count that we had a little bit ago, because our numbers can change on any given day, um, was 56, and that was about a 0.4% of our special education population count. So it is a, what's called a low incidence um, disability within uh, Baltimore County Public Schools, but we are very proud to provide the provision of services to our our students and as you'll see it actually expands beyond just the students here in Baltimore County to whom we provide the interpreting services. Great, so interpreting services as an overview are incredibly important and critical for access to education, not just for students, but also for family members and staff members, because we also have staff who are deaf of hard of hearing as well. So they are um, important in that they provide a um, ability to translate the information that someone who is deaf or hard of hearing cannot hear physically. So they provide a service whether they're using sign language or even speech to text transcription in order to provide that uh, communication. Our office is very fortunate in being able to um, assist with this process with the scheduling of the services. So we have a process in place so that schools, families, staff can request that service. Um, and we do have staff as well as um, contractor providers who provide the service. 
So the sign language interpreter convide, conveys all the auditory information to deaf participants through sign communication and then combine, conveys all signed information to the hearing participants through spoken English. And the responsibilities of educational sign language interpreters, those are the staff in the county who really work directly with students in the classrooms. Um, and that is all from, you know, ages three through 21. And um, so they, they are right in the classrooms. They also assist with the implementation of supplementary aids and su supports as well as direct service um, on the IEP service delivery. Next slide. So in terms of access, there are definitely different types of communication strategies and communication modes that um, actually can actually change over time too. Some remain constant, but um, you may be familiar with American Sign Language. Uh, Pigeon is another version. Speech to text transcription again. Cued speech is another one. And oral interpreting. So there are different methods. Right now, um, a data point is we provide 253 hours per week of interpreting services. Can I ask you, um, I, I worked for Verizon and I had a deaf employee um, and many of us learned some sign language so every day to just communicate. But when I was holding a meeting, I would hire a, a translation specialist to make sure that everything that I said, this employee, you know, knew every word that I was saying. Are we talking about using this service for special things like IEP meetings or everyday learning in the classroom? This is for everything. It is both, um, everyday. Both and all. It's <laughs> learning in the classroom. It is before, during, and after school activities and on the weekends so that families can participate as well. And is it envisioned, and you may get to this, as a one-on-one, -on -one, if I am a student who has a hearing problem, either total deafness or some type of hearing loss, do, do I have a person assigned to me? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, so, and again, these services are required by law. Um, one, when we're going to mention from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, specifically states the public agency must take whatever action is necessary to ensure that the parent understands the proceedings of an IEP team meeting, including arranging for an interpreter for parents with deafness, which is an example of what you also spoke to, Ms. Mack. And right now, another data point was we had 274 parent requests to date. So in addition to the IDA, um, so within our office, we are supporting fiscally and the coordination of the interpreting services for students within our school system and within our schools. But then we are also um, responsible for the, and supporting the coordination facilitation of interpreting services from our office for um, current employees and then also for the parents and families. Um, we are responsible for um, ensuring that families have access to this, whether it is for an IEP team that maybe their own child may um, have this need. But in many of these cases, when we're talking about um, families, it is not connected or aligned to a student with an IEP. So it's not that connection within, within our system. We, provide this for any parent um, who or guardian um, or family member who requires that service. Um, just to give you a few examples of that, we want to make sure that we provide services for just conferences. Back to school night is a very popular night um, in our office. We want to make sure that families have access to that level. Assemblies, concerts, um, graduations, those are the types of events that we also coordinate and um, support fiscally the service of the, interp the interpreting service to um, that family member so that way they can have access as well. And that is also for employees. We do have some employees who do require this accommodation. And do you and use the services of one provider versus many? Because um, I know when I used to have to arrange Sometimes there weren't people available and I'd have to go to another company mm -hmm. um, because it was imperative that I, my employee mm -hmm. understood what was being said in a meeting. So um, is it one company, many companies, many providers? That will be the contract yes. that you'll so, see at the next board meeting. Okay. There yes. are Multiple several. bidders. And yeah. a lot of this has been, um, I think, some 
it's been educating the schools as well on how to access and request that level of service that we've also seen a huge increase just to share with you um, from the number of services that we've provided just in a change of two years for staff members went from 70 to 139 so we're seeing a huge increase in that area and a positive um, increase for us was giving this access to family members we saw just by I think educating the schools more and making sure families were more aware of this opportunity from one year we had 243 members and we increased it to 983 so it was a huge significant increase to allow our families opportunities to participate in their children's or their child's event at school thank you thank you okay so likewise uh, question. i do have one more question are we or will we be billed on a per uses basis basis or a contractable basis or a combination of both so with the contract you will see there are um, guidelines but it is per per hour okay okay so was mine mm -hmm. okay thank you you're welcome anybody have any questions concerns comments no c question or concern just a comment um I think you guys do amazing work, and I just want to say thank you to the Office of Special Education for the services that you provide. No child left behind and no family left behind, and that is impactful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, likewise, this is for approval. <laughs> All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, and then coming up to join uh, Dr. Wisted is Ms. Uh, Stansberry, and we'll be sharing with you um, a resource that will be coming forward uh, related to Title I and our LEAP grant. Yes. Okay, so um, this academic enrichment program you'll be seeing coming forward as a uh, contract. That'll be the title of the contract, but Ms. Stansbury is here to explain kind of the details of how we got to this place. There is a, a specific grant on top of the Title I grant that affects Title I schools, and um, Ms. Stansbury will explain the program. Okay. So um, the Learning and Extended Academic Program is an MSDE grant and it is accessible only to schools who have 80% or higher poverty rates. So for our district, we have four schools that fall into that threshold. Um, Deep Creek Elementary, Hawthorne Elementary, Sandalwood, and Riverview Elementary. Riverview happens to be one of our schools whose um, poverty percentage is declining on an ongoing basis. They are one of our CEP schools. They went from being 93.74% high poverty to 83.45% in five years. So um, for each year, this grant will be renewed by the state, and if they fall below the 80%, they will not have access to the program. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear that these are the only schools for the current year, and in future years, schools will be selected. So the grant amount that we were awarded by MSDE was about 341000 and it has to be fully expended by September 30th of this current year. So we are looking at using the LEAP grant funds in a summer program. And the grant was just awarded in February, as you see. By the way. Oh, yes. So, so that's a reason for the Escalated. quick turnaround. <laughs> correct, <laughs> correct. Um, MSDE was just a tad bit delayed mm -hmm. in giving us um, our allocation. So the program is designed to support and supplement our ELO program. So ELO is a Title I summer program that has been in place for approximately five years. We provide um, services to students in all 63 of our Title I schools. And those students are entering grades one through five, not current grade one through five students, but entering grades one through five. And they receive instruction in ELA math, and they get to elect one STEM elective, coding or arts and engineering. All of the students at these four schools will already be in the half-day elite pro a yellow program, they will stay and extend their summer program to the afternoon to participate in the LEAP program. So the LEAP program is designed to provide enrichment activities for students. All of the enrichment activities will have a connection to mathematics. 
Students will have an opportunity to participate in programs that are designed around robotics, mural painting, sewing, cooking. There's a whole variety of programming that will be accessible to them. This did go out for bid, and the um, I believe will be coming up for contract review soon. So we would be working with a vendor to provide the services to students. Um, the vendor that we've selected is going to work closely not only with the Title I office, but with the Office of Mathematics to ensure that the math enrichment activities are fully embedded and aligned with the needs of the students who will be participating in the program. So the um, vendor will select an on-site enrichment facilitator or several on-site enrichment facilitators to run the enrichment programming. Um, there will be facilitators identified for robotics, for sewing, for cooking, um, and students will have the opportunity to elect up to two enrichment electives to participate in in the afternoons. Um, there's one site program director who will be on site at all times. That person will also be available during the morning program in ELO so that they are aware of what students are learning in the morning and that learning can transfer over in the afternoon if adjustments to programming needs to take place. We are working collaboratively with the staff in the ELO STEM camp to determine of those staff at those four schools, would they be interested in teaching an enrichment program? Many of our staff are very skilled in a variety of areas, and so they would work with the vendor to continue service, and that continuity provides opportunities for students to be familiar with the, stu with the um, staff that they're working with. And um, the vendor also will organize transportation to take students home. So we are bringing students to the school in the morning for the ELO program and using community bus stops to do so. And the vendor will use the same community bus stops to take the students home at the end of the school day. Talk about that. Yes, so um, the program will be fully evaluated by um, an outside evaluator, that is a requirement. I think I skipped that part of the earlier slide. It is a part of the grant requirement that the evaluator is outside of the district. So we are working with the Office of Research to identify and work with an evaluator to build a, fill, a full evaluation plan that is acceptable for us in BCPS. This will be four weeks. It's the same number of weeks as our regular summer program from July 9th through August 2nd, I believe, or 3rd. What time in the morning? Does it start and what time, with the additional afternoon sessions, what time would it end? So students would be there for a seven hour day. They arrive and the, the times are different depending on schools, just because transportation can drop everyone off at the same time. Um, students arrive and they have breakfast. Then they go into their learning sessions, and then at the end of the ELO program, they have lunch, and then they'll transition from lunch into their enrichment programming. Thank you. You're we welcome. will, and I know Ms. Adequary, you were trying to um, speak, so forgive me for interrupting, but uh, we'll be bringing forward to the curriculum committee in uh, June, because May we're talking about special education, uh, but in June we'll be bringing forward all of our summer programs so that you can see that schedule, and you have, we'll share with you more what those morning learning sessions um, are incorporated and um, and then typically in August we come back and let you know how many students participate and we can extend during the summer an invitation for you to come and see them in action as well thank you Miss Mack answered the question about the time and then okay. I just had a question about lunch and breakfast and they'll be receiving that will there be snack time because I know little kids I don't know no, there won't be snack, but um, and during breakfast, if they have breakfast in the classroom, sometimes they have graham crackers. Mm -hmm. As long as they stay in the school and maybe on like a community table, if students get hungry, they can always go back and grab an extra snack. Okay, and then I also had a question. So I remember when I first became student member, I received the presentation about the STEAM. So I know they have a summer showcase, and I was wondering, would this extended day program also have a summer showcase? 
showcase as well? So all of our schools um, put together a showcase at the end of the program just to demonstrate the projects that they've worked on. The students work very hard on um, puppet showcases and all types of things, and they want to be able to show that off. So yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So likewise, this is for, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Ms. Frank -Valley. I'm just curious, two of those schools are in my district. What kind of participation rate do you get? So that's a really interesting question. The participation rate varies only because some parents can't afford afternoon care and our current ELO program is half day. So extending this to a full day, we anticipate participation will be great. I must say to you that one of the schools, Riverview, they currently have a very similar program in their school um, through another grant. And it has been exceptionally um, successful. Riverview has a very high ELO participation rate. And so duplicating some of what they're doing in the other three schools, we believe will be very successful. Riverview is a school that I just visited and mm -hmm. the principal did discuss that and said that it is desperately needed in yes. their neighborhood and that many, many, many students take full advantage of it full advantage they and they don't miss Fridays Fridays happen to be days during the summer when kids don't come in um, and they come in on Fridays because they want to participate in the program Riverview is a testament to that also and, we just wanted to note that the contract that you'll be seeing will include not only this 340,000 that Ms. Stansbury mentioned, but it will be for multiple years, and there could be an opportunity for extended day during the school year as okay. well. So it'll be more than what she showcased. Absolutely. And right along with that, what kind of participation rate do we get in the morning program before they go? Do we have those kind of numbers? Um, we do. I don't have them right off it, the top of I'm my head. I'm just curious. To bring them to the summer program. <laughs> I, I totally can bring them to the summer no, program I, meeting, but. Um, Based on the number of students that come, the participation rate is high. Having students come and stay, that number we're trying to work on. And we believe that this afternoon component will actually work. So we'll have students who are enrolled and attend, but then do not continue to attend throughout the duration of the program. The ones who are enrolled and attend, and they continue to come, their, their attendance is up in the 90%. And will the vendor be hiring a lot of our teachers? We are going to work very closely with the vendor to look at some of our staff in our in BCPS, whether it be in those schools or other schools who have the capacity to run the enrichment programming. Yes. But just to be clear, we hire the teachers for the morning portion, Correct. the ELO. The yes. vendor doesn't handle the morning, which is the teaching portion, as opposed to the enrichment, which is the supplemental. Right. And I'm, I'm curious, why do we need a vendor for this? Why couldn't, you know, is it, is it just too much added responsibility f for a staff to be involved in that hiring of the program director and the hiring of the people? The grant requires community partnerships. So we needed to partner with members of the community in order to provide the service. And um, I will say that the vendor that we're, we were taking a look at was the vendor that was working with Riverview. And they did an exceptional job. We were very happy. We visited the program several times in prior summers and were very happy with what we saw. So we felt like this was the best avenue since they already had pre-established programming, pre-established designs um, we considered that this might be the best avenue to go. And, and just take a guess, if we had 650 kids in an elementary school, are we talking about 10% taking advantage of the summer program? There are about 80 students who are invited per school. Okay, thank you. It's a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, this is for approval, and you'll see this coming forward, I think, in the May May 7th. May 7th. Mm -hmm. that, any questions? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, everyone. I know we're getting close to um, 
the end of our agenda. So Ms. Shea and Mr. Billingsley are coming forward uh, with an instructional resource that I believe will not be in our May 7th meeting. Um, and we're um, looking at it. I'm not sure if there's one uh, contract later in May or if the next one would be June. But be June. It would It'll be June. It'll come in June, yep. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon. We are here to talk about an instructional research to support um, social studies instruction, specifically geography, as you can probably guess from the title. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Billingsley so that he can explain what it is and why we need it. <laughs> so tonight I get the pleasure it. of it, um, bringing the world to students, right? Like right. That, that, that's, that's the um, upside. So what is MAPS um, 101? What's well, a multidisciplinary geographical resource that helps students deepen their understanding of um, the Earth's physical and human features while also developing their geospatial skills. It um, is supported, uh, supports disciplinary literacy aligned to MSDE social studies standards and the C3 uh, social studies frameworks. C3 stands for college career and civic life. It is a K through 12 resource that is um, includes but is not limited to interactive map collections, reference atlases, and digital field trips, which I think is one of the coolest features of the resource. <clears throat> I think numbers speak loudly. So my coordinator, Mike Crispins, pulled some data from maps to see how, how we are currently utilizing, because we currently have maps. This is a renewal of a contract. You can see the number of logins per month um, and you got to remember, that in certain context, that we use this primarily in grades one, two, and three. Um, we're expanding that and better utilizing the resource. But currently, we have about 7,000 um, logins per month, about 180, um, 1,000 um, sign-ins for the for, from July 16 to uh, or July 1 of 16 into September 13 of uh, 2018. To break that down, that equals about 120,000 clicks. Um, per month or 3.1 million clicks over the course of that sample size. So is it a resource, resource that teachers and students are using? Absolutely. <laughs> so how, <clears throat> how is it currently used today? Well, currently we use it as it's a primary um, or elementary resource that we use. We primarily use it in grades one through three to support the um, geo-literacy. We have kind of a future orientation in terms of bringing it in and using it within our kindergarten curriculum because developing geospatial skills is critical um, for both supporting math and social studies. And it's an ancillary material for grades four and five, though um, with the kind of MSD rewrite, we visual or intend to use it um, quite a bit more. So with the expansion, moving out of elementary into making a true K through 12 resource. Um, again, it will be aligned with our new four or five curriculum that we're, we're in the process of developing. It will highlight um, throughout the secondary as where is, is instructionally appropriate, but you can imagine in world history, in US history, um, that'll be a resource that's heavily used. One of the coolest features is it the integration with the um, ESRI geo inquiries. So these are sort of like um, part scavenger hunt uh, that students kind of work through and go on a kind of a virtual field trip slash um, scavenger hunt to find out and kind of make that inquiry based instructional um, discoveries. And finally, it'll be infused um, in our AP human geo course. If I can just add some of the nuts and bolts, it was selected um, as aligned with policy and rule 6002. <laughs> um, and so we did engage, even though it was a renewal, we engaged in that process and involved stakeholders in reviewing the resource. Um, Mr. Billingsley also referenced some of the professional development. So as you can see from the clicks, our elementary teachers are very comfortable with this resource, as are our elementary students. Part of that professional development support will be about how we engage our secondary teachers, because this would be a tool that would be relatively new. Um, we every year get one day where we get to meet with every single secondary social studies teacher um, as part of that back to school week. And so this will be a part of that offering um, for teachers as a way of supporting as well as with our department chairs. And I would say, speaking to that, just yesterday, we were, I was meeting with my middle school department chairs, and they said, John, what are we going to do about um, geography skills? <laughs> and I said, 
Just Hold wait. On Just <laughs> hang on. I, ha I have hope that we'll have put this resource in your hand. And um, so they were very excited about it. And I'm really excited because we've just rewritten the American government course and doing the geo inquiries. They have a geo inquiry is what is freedom? And it looks at freedom throughout the world. And you can click on the map and see what countries are considered free. And then you can drill down to see if a country isn't free, is it not free because of freedom of press? Um, and, and other subcategories, so it really allows you to examine your world. Um, so when we talk about Syria or North Korea, we can build some geo context around that. Um, they also have wonderful election maps, so I cannot wait for 2020 to come around and, <laughs> and utilize that. But um, currently, we, we, we are working with Maps 101. They will present at the um, August PD to our secondary folks because our elementary folks are just um, well-grounded in, in the use of resources. They've had it for a period of time. Um, so with that, in June, we will be bringing forward a contract for a renewal. Um, the renewal is for a three-year term. Um, in terms of uh, cost, we, um, this one, we, and uh, we were joking about putting the world in students' hands. Um, it's purchased as a site license, so it's for every user. Every student, every teacher in the entire system will have access. And um, if we only counted students, it's roughly 33 cents a year. <laughs> for the students to use it as often as they want. If we added in teachers, the cost obviously even goes down per user, so. Is it compatible with Chromebooks? It is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? It's a great resource. It is a great resource. Awesome. Okay, Thank you. So if we could have a vote as well yep. for this. All in favor. Okay, Thank, thanks you so Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Billingsley. You're welcome. And right, then, Mr. Handy. last but not least, <laughs> um, is our uh, music uh, instruments, music and dance. Been playing We're musical really instruments music. while you walked up and, uh, to take us out to vacation. So this one will be really quick because we stand between us and, and spring blink, as the kids have been calling it. So right? Is that right, Ms. Edicola? Spring blink. <laughs> Let me just say, I don't, I'm not sure that Mr. Handy's had a chance to meet this new curriculum committee since January. I know, Ms. Pesher, you're well versed. But uh, for our other members of the committee, Mr. Handy is our director who oversees uh, career technology education and our fine arts. Fine so. arts, yes. We talk a lot Good about everyone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a um, contract that we will be bringing forward. This one is in May, um, will be coming up soon, about music instruments. So it probably goes without even um, needing explanation, but. We need instruments. We um, purchase musical instruments to support the instructional programming at all levels, elementary, middle, and high. It begins in grade four um, with explicit instruction around exploratory music where students are introduced to different instruments so that by grade five, those students that are interested can select an instrument to pursue. Now, of course, the teachers use instruments as part of the music programming with um, even as young as our primary students, but that's where the instruction for students in performing happens. Um, I'm not clicking, Jeremy. Let me try again. Let's see. Nope. Could you click for me? Okay. Yep, there we go. So um, the Office of Music and Dance has, as part of our operating budget, we um, purchase these instruments at these different levels. And um, what our music office has identified is that um, the um, inventory does get old, obviously, after use and wear and tear. And so um, it is necessary to replenish um, the inventory to be sure that our instruments are um, quality for our students for instruction. Um, in addition, we would be using this contract to support magnet program as our music um, programs. And many of you um, had an opportunity to see some of our incredible um, musicians showcased recently at our magnet conference, but also um, at many of the different opportunities we have around the county. Um, and then part of this contract would also support the expansion as we have new schools come on. So we would be able to, as part of the future capital projects, when we open a new school, it becomes important that we outfit them with musical instruments as well. Um, and so the contract that will be coming forward um, will be with um, for, I believe it's five years, and there would be seven vendors. So I know we often talk about it's not just one. So obviously we can, um, this was not 6,002 per se. This was about most responsive, um, responsible bidder because it, not curriculum. trumpet is a trumpet, right? <laughs> but we want to make sure that it's um, being awarded in the bid process as we would use with other materials, if you will. This might make me old, but children no longer rent they did. 
um, instruments from Bob's music? So we do. So this, um, we had this conversation earlier today. So this um, is in, in essentially to ensure that every school has an inventory of musical instruments for instruction. And then for students who are not able to afford renting, then they can get a loan of an instrument from the school. So there are still some students that do rent their own. Um, my son is playing a trumpet right now. Um, this particular contract, we make sure that every school has an inventory for the instruction, but then also for those students to then use as loaners um, if they are not able to afford renting it on their own. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mr. Handy, did you recently win an award? He sure did. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. So thank, thank you, Ms. McMillian. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We should have well, introduced him that way. Award winning. You should, you should never introduce <laughs> you that way. Yes, we have thank the pleasure you, sir. I do appreciate that. You're of Mr. Handy receiving his award on Tuesday afternoon. MSDE will be recognizing him as, and I know I'm going to get the title, is it change? Agent? Secondary change agent. Secondary change agent for CTE. Thank so thank you. you. I'm honored to represent BCPS in that regard, so mm -hmm. thank you. And I've had the good fortune of seeing Stemmers run steel drum bands several times. Yes, sir. Now, would would those kids, some of those kids, buy those drums, or would they? Would is that something that we would buy and make available to them? I think it would probably be a combination. So I would have to talk specifically with I'm our music curious. office, but yes, I mean it would probably fall into the same. So we would support the purchase of a an inventory, um, but then some students may also. So we can find specifically for that program, uh, but it would fall in line with the same idea. And there's something about the steel drum. They just do so something cool. to me. I, I know. know. Fine. <laughs> feels the like same vacation. Same hold true for Catonsville High School. Right. It right. feels like vacation when you hear a steel drum <laughs> band, doesn't it? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Did you have anything you want to add? Did I forget anything? No, I think okay. we hit everything. Yeah, thank you. Um, all in favor of this contract? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before, Thank before we adjourn, I just have an, a, a question that has nothing to do with any of this. Um, I, during my campaign, use map data, mm -hmm. and I see that it hasn't been updated for, I think it's 2015, 2016. Okay. Is, is there a plan to have it be, be more current because it's where parents go to see how things are going. How things are going. Yeah. What I will do is, because all of that is um, logistically managed by Dr. Brown's Office of Accountability, and I don't want to speak for an area that I'm not, um, I don't know all the ins and outs of his area. So what I will do is I'll go back and talk to Dr. Brown and then um, see about the best way of getting communication to you on uh, where his office is on that. Great, thank okay, you. Okay, you're welcome. There's no other, oh, any other comments, questions? Meetings adjourned. Enjoy your long, what is it called? Spring, spring your break. Your spring blink. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't blink too hard because it's going to be Tuesday. Yeah. yeah.